and welcome to Real Actors, Real Answers, the video podcast where you are the star. Today I have the honor and privilege, um, and I'm very excited, to meet and to have you meet film director John Hancock. John Hancock has done a lot. Uh, I'll just give some names out there. Um, Robert De Niro, Phil Foster, whom I love, Danny Aiello, uh, Cloris Leachman, Sam Elliott, Abe Vigoda, um, Nick Nolte. Now, now that got your attention, let's, uh, let's uh, introduce to you, Mr. Hancock. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I good. Got back, I spent last week in New York, and I'm back home now where I live near Chicago, and it's a little chillier than I thought, but it's very pleasant. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, tell us, let's, there's so much to talk about. I have so many questions. I'm fascinated by your work, um, especially um, uh, the the movie uh, "Beat the Drum Slowly." That, that's so such a deep meaning in that movie. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started, and uh, so I'll just let you go. Well, I grew up in Berwyn and Cicero, Illinois, which are suburbs of Chicago. Went to a huge public high school. Uh, went to Harvard, started directing theater there. Uh, and then I did a hit off Broadway when I was 22, a Brecht play, A Man's a Man, and started working in the theater and, and uh, ran several big regional theaters and won an Obie and this and that. And then I, I got a grant from the American Film Institute to do a short. And uh, I made a, sh a kind of funny short uh, called Sticky My Fingers, Fleet My Feet, about businessmen that played touch football in Central Park. <laughs> That's excellent. And, um, it was nominated for Academy Award, and I started doing movies. So uh, that's how I, that was kind of my calling card that got me jobs. That's amazing. It sounds like you love your work. Um, I do. I've, I've been doing it a long time. I've been directing, you know what? 65 years really and I'm very pleased that that's what I wanted I knew as soon as I started directing I knew that was what I wanted to do I'm one of those people that didn't take a lot of time figuring out who I was and um, oh that's supposed to be not so creative you're supposed to wait until you're like you know Luther or Henry James until you're 39 before you figure out what you want to do but I knew <laughs> When I was, you know, 18, 19, so. That's beautiful. I, I love what you just said. Um, you didn't wait to find out who you were. The only thing I can say about it is that why? Why would you? You know, you, you loved what you did. It started in theater, and you went from there. I love it. Eric Erickson was one of my um, teachers at Harvard, and, and his, he, he, was a proponent in how it was, there were advantages to delaying uh, when you decided what you were going to do, and that it tended to broaden you. In other words, you could uh, get a degree in medicine and also in law before you decided that you wanted to be a writer. Okay, I see. I know where you're coming from. Um, it takes a I little bit a of... Path. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you took a different path. Um, you took your path to your heart. Now, I'm going to ask you, because I'm so fascinated about all your movies, but one of them really always touches my heart, uh, Bang the Drum Slowly. Now, this was before Robert De Niro was Robert De Niro. I mean, he was starting out. Um, how was it working with him, I have to ask? Oh, it was a sheer pleasure. I mean, he at that point, uh, he was so charming and receptive and enthusiastic. I mean, he was... Uh, he got a little tough later, but at that point, he was just wonderful. I noticed that. Um, he took direction well? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. He came in to, uh, to read, you know. Uh, he claims I read him six or seven times, uh, which is possible, because we were trying to figure out whether he should play the pitcher or the catcher and reading him in combinations with other people. But I, I knew... We'd been seeing actors every 15 minutes for like, I don't know, four or five weeks. 
uh, but he came in and started to read, and I, I immediately thought, ooh. No, nobody knew who he was. I mean, it was, but he was uh, very, very convincing. He had a, he had some kind of quality that you admired, right? Well, he could really act. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, those little, especially that one scene where he's sitting in the, um, they come and uh, take him, you know, take him from the hospital. And he's sitting there with the hospital gown. Um, it's a tender moment. He just like, as they say, like made love to the camera. There wasn't any big gestures or anything. It was just very honest. That's what I noticed. Yeah, sometimes he would make a choice that didn't necessarily seem right to me as we were shooting it. But then later in the editing room, I saw that he had uh, had really nailed it. Uh, the scene like that that comes to mind is uh, they're sitting around the locker room on a, a rain delay. The game is delayed because of rain, and they're sitting there, and uh, the character Piney Woods uh, starts to sing the uh, streets of Laredo, and it's about a, a guy who dies young, which De Niro was in the process of doing, and people who know that he's dying are examining him carefully and trying to stop the guy from singing it. But what Bobby did there was so, so perfect. He had, uh, I thought at the time, he has dumb eyes. And how, what? well, dumb eyes. How, how does, you know, the character is not very smart. Oh, yes. And, and, and how, how does a very smart actor uh, create the idea <clears throat> of dumb eyes? And uh, it was only as I thought about it later, watching, you know, when you're editing a picture, you, you get to see it a lot. That what he's doing is surreptitiously trying to get clues from others on how to how to be he's sneaking looks to try to catch on to what smart people are doing and i think that that was my i mean a lot of acting is done by figuring out what the character wants and that was my analysis of the the intention that he was playing and catch up to catch on catch up right I'm, I'm piecing this together from my words. He was, um, he acted delayed in his thinking? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. That he had to, to s s sneak a look at other people before he came out with a little bit. Not always, but uh, cautious, you know. Right. He felt like he, you know, he knew he wasn't so smart. Uh, what, what, was, what captured me in that first reading that he came in, he came in just read, uh, was... It's a scene in which he's chewing tobacco and he's with his uh, roommate on the balcony of a hotel and he's uh, spitting the tobacco juice and he's saying, ooh, curveball, slider, <laughs> right? And, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, what De Niro did as against the many other wonderful good actors that also read for that part is he followed the trajectory of the gob of spit with his eyes. He was seeing it. He was seeing it fall from the second or third floor balcony uh, before he declared whether it was a slider or a fastball or a. So, I mean, to me, one of the good actors are able to put themselves in the place and see, kind of, not actually see what the character sees, but it's in their imagination, see what the character sees. And he had that immediately in that first reading. And that's, I think, is what made me want to read him six or seven times. <laughs> you were discovering him and his yeah. nuances. Yeah. Wow. Um, was that making this film, was that, was that, were there challenges? I mean, baseball is not easy. Uh, no. but we had, we had, uh, we rehearsed it, I think, for four weeks. In New York, and we would have uh, a major leaguer would come and teach them how to play baseball in the mornings, and we would rehearse the scenes in the afternoon. So we had like baseball school. Uh, the 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 real challenge in that movie uh, was related to uh, 
a blessing. I mean, it, it was a, a double-edged sword. Is the producer, a guy named Maurice Rosenfield, was a lawyer, a Hilton lawyer from Chicago, and he put up the money, wanted to do the book, wanted to hire me, did not fire me, um, but was extremely difficult. It was just every day there was some bullshit with Maurice Rosenfield, who he didn't want me to shoot close-ups. He said the close he'd read in Pauline Kale that close-ups were the crutch of a bad director. So I said, but Maury, we we have a 165-page script. We're going to have to trim this. But I need to be able to edit the scenes and lose lines of dialogue. And the only way to do that is um, with coverage. Uh, he insisted that we change De Niro's hairstyle halfway through. He thought it was ugly, and he said, I'm not going to... I, I'm, we're going to close. We're not going to continue. We're not going to complete this unless, so I had to go to Bobby and explain that crazy as it seemed, uh, we had to change. I, I, I tried to explain to the producer. I said, <laughs> you know, you, you have a picture of you and a picture of me and then a picture of you and a picture of me. My hair's different. He said, well, people get haircuts. I said, but not, not while we're talking. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. It's it's <clears throat> it's disgusting. It's just off putting. It's it was he had a kind of fifties. Uh, I uh, noticed that. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. So Maury Maury was. I mean, there are people that were on that picture who still have dreams where they're delivered to him in a packing case and come out and kill him and his children. I mean, there. He had the money. He loved the book. He let us do it. He finally did not interfere in destructive ways. Uh, but he made it every day was a nightmare. It, one of the positive results was that he was so difficult that everybody uh, else really got along. I mean, you could see where maybe uh, Michael Moriarty and De Niro uh, would have fought. Uh, but did not. I mean, it was he was draining all of the evil on the set. So it was good. <laughs> wow. Never know what's going on in the no. background until you talk to the director. Yeah. Um, you also in that movie, and I've always loved him. I didn't know he did so many different things because as I was growing up, I watched Laverne and Shirley. Uh, Phil Foster? Yeah. He has every everything he's done. He's always bringing out the same attitude. Yeah, he's attitude. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but he's so delightful. How was it to work with him? It was fun. He was fun. Yeah, I wanted Charlie Durning for that part, and I would have rather had Charlie. But Phil was uh, a little more of a type, uh, <laughs> and uh, but I, he was fun. Everybody, it was everybody was a delight except the producer. Oh my! Well, <clears throat> that just pushes the envelope, I guess. I have a funny story. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, funny, funny ha, ha, not funny, haha. Ha, but um, okay. many years pass, right? It gets to be sometime in the nineties, and uh, I thought, well, I had a difficult time with him, but. He's a human being after all. So I called him up and we had lunch at his club in Chicago. And I said, ah, Maury, you know, we had our troubles, but, you know, we made a, he said, what about, what about the flowers and the funeral scene? He was still sore. <laughs> I, thought, I had ordered up flowers for the funeral scene at the end without getting his okay, right? Oh. Right. And I, I said, oh, fuck it. Oh, and so take it out of my salary. And he did. He did. <laughs> oh, brother. Some people. It, it yeah. makes for good stories, though. Yeah, yeah. I would, so he did have, have, I would rather not have had the good stories and not been tormented every day by this asshole. I understood, you know, but it is a work of art. He, he didn't yeah. like the flowers. Is that what it was? I, I think he was enforcing a point that he had to okay every expense. I mean, what was it like seven hundred dollars or something? You know. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Art, art is expensive sometimes, you know. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, there's another movie, um, Prancer. I know that's very popular with many people. Cloris Leachman, Abe Vigoda from Barney Miller. 
uh, uh, Sam Elliott, of course, 1989. Tell, tell us something about that. Well, that was a project that uh, came to me through uh, <coughs> Rafaela De Laurentiis. I had done weeds uh, with her father, and she was kind of the executive at DEG that was in charge of that for him. So we got to be friends and, and liked each other a lot. And she brought me a, a script uh, in which the story was good, but the dialogue was, was not good. Uh, so I said I would do it if we could find the right girl and if my wife could fix the dialogue and without credit. Dorothy did it without credit because we, we thought if, as, if the director always brings in his wife, you're not going to endear yourself to good writers. Wow. So I didn't want that known at the time. So, okay. Um, but uh, I shot it where I live. I mean, I shot it in the, on the family fruit farm in Northwest Indiana, where I live now. Uh, and that was extremely pleasant. And Sam was wonderful. And we found uh, the perfect uh, child actress, uh, Rebecca Harrell. She's now, by the way, directing and, and has, a, has been making a series of kind of environmental documentaries with her husband that go to Cannes and Tribeca and win first prize. And, wow. and I think she's done her first uh, fiction picture as a director, too, so... Uh, I, I worked with her twice, uh, three times more. I did a, a Danny Aiello television series with her, and then she played the female lead in uh, my picture, A Piece of Eden, and then she was in suspended animation, too. I noticed that, yeah. You know, you had a... <clears throat> there's many times where I myself have met professors and teachers and people like yourself um, <clears throat> that said something, did something, that changed the course of my life. You had a you had a pivotal uh, moment um, with her, obviously, because look at what she's doing now. I guess, yeah. I suppose if she had not been in Prancer, it wouldn't have. Right. A number of people that uh, I have worked with have said, "Oh, I want to direct," and I've always had a mixed feeling. I, I I think it maybe it stems well if this guy could do it I can do it so oh. I don't know exactly what it comes <clears throat> with it but I, I it, it's flattering but in a way maybe not right right it's with with age comes wisdom you know um, experience did you have this is an odd question but of course there was a deer in there did you have trouble with the deer <laughs> well. Yes. I mean, we had six of them in case uh, oh. the, the, the principal uh, reindeer lost its antlers, which they, <laughs> which they were scheduled to do during the shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we ended, we only shot the one deer as the principal. They, uh, not that we would, couldn't have gotten away with doubling because they're very, all look the same anyway. But um, yes, the deer was, uh, they're, they're borderline untrainable. I mean, uh, oh. we used other deer to motivate them. In other words, we would put, you know, screens in front of several of their friends, friend deer. And if you want the deer to look away, then you take the screen down and the deer goes, because they're such herd animals, they want to join the... So that didn't always work. And I, I started to feel that the deer was was perverse and <laughs> refusing to look and, and the deer pissed off the crew enough that they wanted to eat it for the rat party. <laughs> but, it's funny. But I, I, once I tried to outlast the deer, I thought, well, it will eventually turn if I just, so I rolled. Okay. Action. And the deer is looking the wrong way, looking the wrong way, looking the wrong way. I blew through a thousand of uh, a whole mag of film. <laughs> then when the camera stopped, uh, the deer turned. I think it was responding to maybe to the sound of the motor of the film. It was, it, it knew when you were shooting. I don't know, but was I? I didn't want to eat the deer. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny though. The crew did. <laughs> that, that's um, you know I've always been interested, very curious about animal wrangling. You know, and and, and teaching a. They're wild. You can't really take the wild out of them, so they do what they want, you know, instinctively. 
Well, that deer, we, we were fascinating. It, it had, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, 40 pound test or something, uh, monofilament line around its midsection. And we were anchoring it uh, to uh, something we drilled into a country road here. And it hooked the Wrangler uh, in the face and cut his cheek to the bone. Ouch. Oh. So, I mean, there was a lot of moments that we had to film where uh, Rebecca, the little girl, was very close to the deer. So we were, we had, you know, had her go to the local stables where it lived during pre-production and feed it carrots and apples and shit every afternoon in an attempt to ingratiate herself. And she did not get hurt, but we, it was, we were holding our breath always. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> in certain scenes, uh, we had a, a vet standing by because we uh, drugged the deer with a wonderful tranquilizer called Rompum. <laughs> Did it calm it down or what? Oh my God, yes. It made it <laughs> it's like, a, like a heroin. It was pretty. <laughs> I've it's never heard a story. It was on the nod, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's well, a beautiful... You, be you don't want to overdose. You know, you, you, it still has to be able to be filmed. You don't want to just have it lie there. Right? Sure. It reminds me of what they do in uh, Spain where, you know, the bullfighters, they drug and, and do terrible things to the bull for the sake of the show because if they didn't do anything, then... I don't care what kind of cape you have or movements, yeah. you're going to die. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, um, another movie, if I may say, John is um, really touched my heart because uh, about Alzheimer's and the looking glass. What a powerful um, title for that story. Oh, well, thank uh, you. Yeah. How was that? Well, my wife wrote it and played the female lead in it, right? Yes. Uh, and she was, she, my wife died last January after battling Alzheimer's for 12 years or so, more maybe. My, and sorry. So this was, she was writing about the early stages of Alzheimer's and trying to uh, remember her lines while we were doing it. A lot of it was improvised because she couldn't remember her lines. Sure. So it was, uh, but it was uh, a joy to do. We, we found this wonderful local girl, Grace Tarnow, who was really good. And uh, it was, once again, I shot it at my house. So it was, that was fun. Um, it was originally called Swan Song, but everybody thought that was depressing. So we we changed it to looking yeah. at it. <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's powerful. The message behind it is powerful. Um, you know how you see something in a film that you can't put into words? That that was it for me, actually. What was it? <laughs> I can't put it into words. It was so heartfelt every moment. I'll give you one example. When the little girl, I forgot her name, her stage name. Uh, um, yeah. Julie. But, but Julie. Julie. But she, um, when she got the part... And then your wife hugged her, oh, and she was so happy. Yeah, it was that. It it was like. Yeah. 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 That was amazing. Yeah. Well, my wife was an awfully good actress as well as a writer. So. Yeah. I could tell. Yeah. I could tell. It was uh, something I, I would suggest everybody see. Oh, um, good. Thank it's, you. It's one of those moments that you walk away and you're really quiet, not because, well, just because everybody reacts differently, you know. What was, I got to ask this because I grew up with her as well. It's uh, uh, just inside stories. You have so many. <clears throat> Working with Cloris Leachman. She's a great, uh, she was a great comedian, but how was it working with her? It was very pleasant, but she, I, I, I never understood a word she said to me. <laughs> um, Gus Van Sant wonderful director, said, I spend a great deal of time pretending that I understand what the actors are saying. 
<laughs> and, and that was really true with Floris. I mean, I, I think she had just had some, She maybe she was always that way, but I think her son had just died of an overdose or something. So oh. she, she was uh, troubled, but but cheery. She was easy to work with, never the slightest difficulty. She's performing in a slightly different style than anybody else in that movie. It's a little more out of a children's story or something. But yeah. but I didn't mind it. I just liked what I was getting from her, and I let her do it. It's quite different when, than what she did in Last Picture Show, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> I... Uh, I know directors have different ways of approaching a scene and um, some people, it might be a small thing, but I always thought I, I have a question for you. When you go, um, when you're getting ready and everything is set, then you say action. Some people say whenever you're ready. Um, what do you say? Well, if sometimes if it's an emotional scene, uh, and I want them to be doing some preparation. I'll actually have them do some kind of Strasberg and Stanislavski called effective memory, or I'll just have them put themselves in the places. I'll t have them tell me when to roll, give me a thumb up, and then then oh, wow. roll when they're so. I I believe sometimes actors need a moment first, and that and when you're ready is like a kind of miniature version of that, you know. Yeah. Would, so you're not saying, okay, start now, uh, you give them a chance to do it when they're ready. So that's a value. But other times it's, it's just simpler to say go or action, or, you know. Sure. You got it. You play it by uh, the individual. It depends on the actor or the, the type of scene. I, I do think that one of the functions uh, of a director is to control the uh, atmosphere and mood on the set. And that... Uh, the funeral scene, for example, in uh, The Looking Glass. I mean, uh, I, I liked what I got there. And part, partly, um, I think it was the result that I, I started with the shot that almost ends it where uh, the little girl is on the couch and she's singing along with uh, her dead grandma. And uh, I sat on the couch with her and I was crying. Uh, and she was comforting me before, as we were do as we were lighting it, right? So it set a certain kind of mood on the set that I think paid off. Um, did I do that uh, on purpose? Yes, to some degree. I, I let myself do it, you know. Um, and I, I've I've been teaching. I'm not teaching directing anymore, and I'm very happy I'm not because I, I I wasn't enjoying it, but. Um, one of the things that I showed my students about controlling a mood on a set is was Jonathan Miller uh, was a like an hour show of, or maybe longer of Jonathan Miller directing um, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan and in the theater and how how he gets everybody laughing on the he's creating a such a happy atmosphere on the set to do a comedy you know and. Uh, you know, you, you, what you don't want is you're having a tender love scene in action. You know, you don't want that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it. You're in control of the atmosphere, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Very. You try to be, you try to be in, unless somebody subverts it. And, right. You know, I, try, I, I try to avoid those actors. I've, one of the things I've learned is, is uh, when... People tell you somebody is incredibly difficult. To listen, you know. Don't try again. Well, I have made the mistake early in my career several times when people have warned me against certain actors in the theater in New York, uh, and I've gone ahead and cast them anyway, uh, <laughs> and regretted it. I mean that if. if People go out of their way to tell you this person is impossible. Don't, don't ignore it. You know? Oh, wisdom! You just taught me something. <laughs> Why well, you've learned the same lesson? And different ways as a coach, yeah. Yeah, as an acting coach, you know, <clears throat> you you're accepting of who they are, but you don't have to accept them. 
<laughs> right. No, you don't have to hire them. Right. Life's too short for that. That's what I feel. Yeah. Oh, and they hurt. They hurt the other. It hurts the other performances. Oh yeah. my! It's an yeah. ensemble. Absolutely, right down to the caterer. I mean, everything. You know, yeah. I've always loved. I grew up with. I always loved uh, the Twilight Zone. Now, in the '80s, you directed the, that series. What do you think of Rod Serling's version and your version? Well, I prefer the Rod Serling version, but uh, they were. I, I I admired the people I was working with on the the '80s Twilight Zone series. I, Phil Daguerre was a wonderful executive producer, and Harvey Friend was a wonderful producer, and we had a good cameraman and the best a ads I've ever worked with. Wow. And it was a good casting people. It was uh, a very well-run operation that they didn't interfere with you much. And uh, those were happy experiences. Uh, I like episodic television. I mean, uh, I, I like it more to do it than to see it, but to, to see my work. But because um, I like to shoot fast. I don't like a lot of uh, time on lighting and all that. So... Um, it was, it, they were very pleasant to do. Uh, the scripts were, some of them were really good. Some of them were uneven, uh, but it was a job and I, uh, I enjoy working. So, uh, they, were they as good as the original? No, but I mean, um, the times had changed. Uh, maybe the, I mean, Rod Serling was, had a unique dark spirit, uh, that maybe was not present in the. Uh, he was a big fan of my picture. Let's scare Jessica to death. By the way. Oh, that's another yeah, good one. He, he, okay. he went around the country uh, raving about it, and uh, I can see why because it has a unique dark spirit. Uh, yes, it does. It, it's it's not playing, and he wasn't playing, uh, and. Uh, it was remarkable. I mean, I, I love that. I loved your know. series though too. It was a, uh, it was a welcome change. I think uh, just out of pure curiosity, I, I watched it and followed it. Followed what? I uh, followed your version of the Twilight Zone, the series. Oh, you did. Okay. Oh yeah, it was. You know, okay. I'm not going to be closed-minded. Yes, that was good. I'm curious. I've always been more curious than not. Sometimes get me in trouble. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, I thought, I want to know the difference. I want, I'm curious. I want to know, you know, and it was entertaining and very in-depth, ponderous. So Yeah, I don't think, they, they didn't have, maybe the writers weren't as good on the recreation as they were on the, I don't know. Or maybe it was, it, it was just hard. It, you know, it, any sequel is hard. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Except Godfather 2. And and actually, Cameron did a wonderful sequel to Aliens too. So true. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a few out there that that yeah. maintain their quality. Another thing that I grew up with, and it was so true to life, it disturbed me, but I couldn't take my eyes off of it. And that was your Hill Street Blues. Yeah. That I, that I, was. I, I love doing those shows. Yeah. Yeah, they were wonderful. Good cast, good scripts, yeah. yeah. It was filmed in New York? No, they were filmed in L.A., but they oh. had some stock footage that I think that they'd shot in Pittsburgh or Chicago or one place or another. But, we, yeah, we chose locations uh, in downtown L.A. that looked like a Midwestern city. Uh, it was, you know, it was supposed to, I mean, Hill, Hill Street is a, uh, uh, a certain precinct in Pittsburgh where uh, Steve Bochco and those guys, they, they went to Carnegie Tech, so they knew Pittsburgh real well, and I think they were writing about that. So much to that show, it wasn't like, no offense, but it wasn't like, no offense to that show, what I'm about to say, is Chips. Chips was, hey, you know, it was, it was right. just entertainment. Hill Street Blues was a slice of, like, law and order. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. This is what really happened sometimes, you know, and um, that drove home to me. It's like, this is a real slice of life. How, I'm so curious, with, epi with episodes of a TV series, 
how does that run? Five, <clears throat> you got to work five, six days a week and, and then get a new script the next week or? Well, I think, I think they shot eight or 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they, they were, Hill Streets were, were difficult to make the day because they had so many locations and so many different, you know, squad cars with a different pair of people in them. And, and uh, there were 18 hour days, which really wear a crew down. Uh, we tried to avoid those. There was a very clever, uh, whenever we found a location, we would say, okay, now what's across the street? What other scene can we shoot without moving the trucks? Right, because anytime you move the trucks, you're, you, you've blown three or four hours by the time you're rolling again. So, uh, the, we, I mean, the, the key to doing, to getting a lot of high quality stuff for less money is to consolidate your locations and we, d we worked very hard on Hill Street to do that. We, we would sometimes even just build a little set that was in the same place as something else so that we could just keep, keep shooting without moving the company. Company moves are a huge waste of time. You have to, <clears throat> you have to be creative in the moment. Um, yeah. There's a lot going on in a director's mind. Um, it, you have to wear many hats, as they say, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that, it's, it's such fun, though. I mean, the power of it and whatever. I mean, it really is great fun. Of course, the, the kind of power you have on a, an episodic television is very different than the kind of power you have on a feature. Episodic television, you're a hired hand. You're working in a certain style for the executive producer and for that show, and the actors tend to know their characters better than you would. And so it's it, you have to set your your whole power dial a different way than you do on a feature where you you really are the boss. Um, <clears throat> are you currently working on anything else right now? I am. I've I've got a screenplay um, about a New York detective who falls in love with a female serial killer. <laughs> oh, that's that's and, intriguing. And wow. I've, I've brought a um, a co-writer aboard, Marsha Broadhacker, and we've we've strengthened the love story in it and I've, I'm getting really positive responses from people, powerful people in LA and I'm thinking it's going to happen. Uh, Jeff Berg, that was a very powerful ICM agent and is now a manager and wants to help us put it together and Fred Spector, who's at CAA. And so as soon as the strikes are, all of them are over, uh, right. we're going to try to get it set up. That's exciting. I'll be looking forward to that. If someone wanted to, find you how would they do that besides imdb i my email is john j-o-h-n at film acres f-i-l-m-a-c-r-e-s dot com it's not like filmmakers it's film acres f-i-l-m-a-c-r-e-s dot com I like that. thank you <clears throat> it has been a privilege i've been so excited about uh meeting you you know i talked to you well, on the I'm phone but... it's it's fun to talk to you yeah, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your wealth of knowledge. Uh, and um, I urge everybody to watch uh, John's movies, especially Beat the Drum Slowly, 1973, um, The Looking Glass, 2015, Prancer, 1989. Um, oh, Scare Jessica to Death. That, yeah. Let's, let's, you, let's, what was let's that? Scare, let's Scare Jessica to Death. Oh, let's, excuse me, Let's Scare Jessica yeah. to Death. Um, it's, it's a very good movie, um, and I don't get scared easily. <laughs> but um, thank you, Mr. Hancock, John, to, uh, uh, for being on Real Actors, Real Answers. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome.